going to talk about management of acetabulum fractures in the elderly. Certainly as the population ages, we're seeing more and more of these, though not as common as proximal femur fractures. Uh, I think we should be more aware of these and what they are and how they sh should be treated. So what are the problems? Well, uh, obviously osteoporosis, which creates fixation difficulty. Um, if you're doing arthroplasty, loosening of cup fixation uh, is an issue, number one, because you have a fracture, uh, and it's not like you're just putting a cup into oste uh, osteoarthritic bone. Uh, so you have a fracture and the bone is not good, so if you're going to do a cup, the fixation can come loose. Um, other problems are with the fracture itself, dome comminution and impaction is much more common than it is with uh, other young, healthy trauma patients who get acetabulum fractures. In these elderly patients, you get this um, impaction, like marginal impaction and comminution right where you don't want it, in the weight-bearing dome. Uh, other problems are uh, there's a need for early mobilization, right? So you don't want to hold these patients down. These are patients who, uh, and, and the elderly, you want to get them up and moving right away. So what can you do to achieve that? And of course, medical comorbidities complicate treatments. You're doing a, a big surgery. It's considered a big surgery uh, for a young patient. So to put an elderly patient through that uh, with medical comorbidities is potentially challenging. So the goals are to mobilize the patient and provide some durable treatment and avoid a second surgery if possible. So I think it's important to review the basic fracture types. So if you have to pause, kind of uh, make sure you understand these. I am going to go through these uh, pictorially as well, the, the elementary and associated types in the Jude Letournel classification. So posterior wall fracture is shown here. Um, this is the schematic as shown in the Letournel textbook. Uh, of course, this can be in different shapes and sizes, but that's a posterior wall fracture. The anterior wall fracture is a little different, right? Because the anterior wall fracture technically, uh, in almost all cases, usually involves a portion of the, uh, it breaks through the pelvic uh, brim and uh, it involves the uh, rest of the anterior column as well, as opposed to um, the posterior wall fracture where typically, in most cases, it does not go all the way out through the, the back of the issue. Okay, posterior column fracture, a true posterior column fracture, it's actually kind of uncommon. Um, a lot of times we see posterior wall fractures that are extended fragments that go out into the posterior column, but a real posterior column fracture that looks something like this, uh, that does not involve the anterior column at all, and really no wall fracture is, is shown here, uh, uncommon fracture pattern. Anterior column fractures uh, you will see, um, and uh, as opposed to the uh, anterior uh, wall fracture that uh, kind of comes out and maybe exits here, uh, the anterior column fracture is just kind of the opposite of the posterior column fracture. And, it, and notice in all these schematics how the pelvis is oriented, right, with the, the iliac wing, sort of like an upside down U with the ASIS here and the PSIS here and then uh, the uh, horseshoe of the acetabulum shown exactly upside down. So, okay, so, so, so everything on you know this side is anterior and everything on this side is posterior, okay? Column and when you're talking about the anterior and posterior columns. So that said, Again, pelvis oriented this way, and this is how I think you should think about acetabulum fractures when classifying. Uh, pick up a model, look at it laterally, tilt it, and until you have that U going this way, and everything on once, you know, on, on this side being posterior and everything here being anterior. Um, so transverse fracture, pure transverse fracture goes exactly uh, horizontally through that. Okay, and of course these can be infratectal, right? If they're down here. Uh, infratectal, juxtatectal, transtectal, you know, with respect to where they are um, uh, with relation to the weight-bearing dome, because that's more displacement at the weight-bearing dome, you have to be more critical and anatomic of your reduction. Associated posterior column and posterior wall fracture shown here. Um, common fracture type, okay, uh, here what you can see is that you, you have your, um, or actually not so common, not as common as 
transverse poster wall. I'm sorry, but the, you you will see sometimes where you have a complete uh, posterior column fracture and a posterior wall. Now, sometimes you have an extended posterior wall fracture that extends into the posterior column. Um, probably not a complete posterior column, posterior wall fracture, but sometimes you will see this as well, where this, there's clearly a column disruption and the posterior wall. This is what I was saying. This is actually pretty more, uh, pretty common, transverse posterior wall. We have some type of transverse fracture uh, with a posterior wall fracture. So by definition, because of the posterior wall fracture, you have to address these posteriorly. Whereas the transverse fracture, you possibly could address from the posterior or anterior side, depending on which fracture is more displaced. Okay, uh, But the transverse posterior wall fracture, because of the posterior wall, you have to approach posteriorly. A T-shaped fracture is um, shown nicely here. Of course, uh, the location of the sort of transverse component can be infradectal, juxtatectal, transtectal. Um, but the T-shaped fracture, the, the key thing is there's also a complete split that comes down this way. Now, the implications of this are that Let's go back for a second. With the transverse acetabulum fracture, you can control this entire segment, okay, by grabbing onto this back here. Now you may not get it perfect in the front, but you can get like good control from here, indirectly control this, and then certainly you can kind of get into the sciatic notch up here and uh, potentially uh, get some indirect control on the quadrilateral plate, you know, uh, what I should say, you can come through here and sort of get some indirect or finger control or clamp control on here. But essentially you're, you're controlling the whole lower fragment because it's intact and you can get some control of that. So compare that to here, right? So if you come posteriorly here, you're only controlling this fragment. Right, so it's an important concept. This, this is why it's important to to, to distinguish the T-shaped from the transverse fracture. Because if you think about it, I mean, what does this really mean? You're not going to go in and fix this. The problem is you can't control both fragments directly. Right, so these these will require either you know, two approaches, anterior and posterior, or may require uh, an extensile approach. Uh, it kind of depends on where that transverse uh, fracture component is. If the transverse fracture component is transtectal, you know, and it comes right through the weight-bearing dome, then you, you, you may have to do you know, extended iliofemoral or something that Letronel recommended to be absolutely perfect with your, with your reduction. Okay. Anterior column with posterior hemi transverse. Okay. Now the anterior column fracture can have a variety of, it can exit here, it can exit all the way up here. Um, so there's there's there, there, there are different places where that anterior column line fractures. Uh, but the, the thing is that as opposed to uh, the transverse uh, posterior wall fracture, um, I'm sorry, as opposed to the um, a T shaped fracture, which is in some ways this looks a little bit like, uh, you typically have minimal displacement posteriorly. Okay? Uh, so usually this acts like an anterior column fracture, but then there's also this hemi-transverse, right? So the, the anterior column fracture usually is like something up and down like this, and then you get this hemi-transverse fracture in the posterior column, which usually is not that displaced. So in most cases, these are, these are treated anteriorly, okay? The associated both column fracture, conceptually, you have to think about it as an AO periarticular type C fracture. Right? So all type C fractures mean that the articular fragments are dissociated from the rest of the shaft. Okay? Or in this case, all the articular fragments are dissociated from you know, the sciatic buttress back here, like this area of bone. Okay? Which, so, so when that happens, that's technically an associated both column fracture. So both columns are fractured. But they're all, so let's just go back here, and you can see here, right, both columns are fractured, but this is still intact to here, right? Or here, the dome fragment is still attached to here. I mean, in every single one of these, there's articular fragments that are still attached to the back of the pelvis, okay? But, but, but not with the associated both column, okay, completely detached. So what that means is that potentially 
all the you know all the articular fragments can possibly migrate with the femoral head because none of them are being held back so if that makes sense that's where you can possibly develop what's called secondary congruence meaning that you know the head is not going to uh, necessarily dislocate itself from the dome fragment for instance like a transverse fracture because the dome fragment can go with the head so you don't always get secondary congruence but it can only happen in a both column fracture okay all right so that's just I think a review of some of the important acetabulum fracture concepts but I really wanted to get into the uh, geriatric fracture issues so um, I think I'll take a pause there because that did provide a little bit of a review just of the basic lateral fracture types and uh, we'll jump into the geriatric fracture patterns in the uh, next set of slides. Thanks.